We often give up when we feel discouraged. When we feel discouraged, it's hard to go on because we think to ourselves, what's the point? Why am I doing all these things? Because it doesn't seem to be working. It doesn't seem any point to carry on what I'm doing. Well, today's story, the lesson we're looking at today, is going to be a little bit about discouragement, but not just about discouragement, but also about the way God encourages us. That's the opposite of discouragement, when we are feeling down. But then the king, King Ahab, he went back to his wife, the Queen Jezebel, and he said to her that Elijah has now executed all of the prophets of Baal, and the queen is so angry that instead of believing in God, which she should have done, she decides, I am going to go after Elijah, and I am going to take his life. So when Elijah hears that Jezebel wants to kill him, how do you think he feels? How do you think he feels? Well, I think he feels pretty discouraged. He feels pretty sad, and I think he thinks to himself, what's the point? I've just done all of this great thing, this marvellous thing has been done by God in front of us all, and still the queen wants to kill me. And he knew how powerful the queen was, because the king was quite weak, and the queen seemed to have all the power in their relationship, and that meant that she was the one, really, who was running the country. And if she didn't believe it meant that she still had the power to stop the country from believing in God as well. And so, Elijah is discouraged. We see Elijah here. Here he is. He's standing there, feeling a bit lonely, just standing there in the bleak area. The Bible says he runs away. When he hears that the queen wants to kill him, he runs away 80 miles south to a town called Beersheba. And there he is in the midst of the wilderness. The Bible says that he lay down and he slept under a broom tree. I'm not quite sure what a broom tree is, but the most important thing is that he lay down to rest. The first thing God does is he allows him to sleep. And the psalmist David, he says in, the, in one of the early psalms that even though he might be surrounded by enemies, still he is able to sleep in the presence of the Lord. Because the Lord gives us that peace that passes all our understanding. That's what the Lord does for us. He allows us to sleep. I don't know how you feel about going to sleep every night. Maybe you feel annoyed because you want to stay up later. But sleep does us a lot of good. And when our bodies are rested and refreshed, we actually feel a lot more encouraged about the difficulties that we're going through. The second thing that happens is that while Elijah is sleeping, an angel wakes him up. And the angel says to him, arise, and eat. What's he got there? He's got a, a jar of water and he's got a cake maybe of bread. And so the Lord says to him, arise and eat because you need this to encourage yourself. Sometimes when we're feeling down and we're feeling a bit depressed, eating food can do us good and it can make us feel a lot better. And he goes back to sleep again and a second time the angel wakes him up and says to him, here's some water and here's something to eat because you're going to need this strength to be able to make the journey that I've got for you. And so the Lord sends him on a journey, and he makes this journey for 40 days and 40 nights. Do you think he went to this place by train or bus? No, he walked. Sometimes walking is good for us as well. Exercise can make us feel better. So the Lord makes him go on this long journey, and while he's on this journey, it's an opportunity for him to think about what's been going on, to think about where he's at, maybe to see some new things, maybe to pray to God. And sometimes a journey can do us good and can encourage us as to our walk with the Lord as well. Finally, he arrives at a place called Mount Horeb, the Mount of God. Does anybody know where he stays when he gets to Mount Horeb? Do you know just In a cave, yes, yeah, we show this cave. Here he is in the cave. <laughs> He's in the cave, and he's looking out at the cave. And the Lord speaks to him, and the Lord says to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah says, Lord, I've been doing so many things for you. I've been busy for you. I've been zealous for you. I've been telling everybody about you. I've been telling them that you are the one they need to believe in. And instead, they just want to take my life. I'm the last one of the prophets who are left. The first thing the Lord does is that... He sends a mighty wind. And the mighty wind is so strong 
that it makes the rocks start to break and the rocks get split. Some of the rocks start to fall off the cave. But the Bible says the Lord was not in the wind. The second thing that happens to Elijah as he stands there looking out, what do you think this might be? What happens when this starts to happen? <laughs> An earthquake. Yeah, we get them over here sometimes, don't we? An earthquake happens. And everything starts to shake. But the Bible says the Lord was not in the earthquake. The third thing that happens, as Elijah looks out, is he sees a great fire happen on one of the mountains. And the Bible says still the Lord was not in the fire. And then the Lord speaks to him. When all of these things have calmed down, the Lord speaks to him. It's as if to say that God is saying, you know, I'm not going to come to you in loud and frightening ways, but I'm going to come to you quietly. And that's the way I speak to you. When you speak to God, you know, it's not always with a big booming voice that the Lord is going to speak. He's going to speak to us softly and quietly and gently from the words of the Bible, something little, word in our heart. And that's how the Lord encourages us. And so when the Lord speaks to him, the Bible says that Elijah goes out to the front of the cave and he covers his face with his cloak because he knows that the Lord is coming. And he knows that a person cannot see the Lord and live. And so he goes out and he covers his face with his cloak. And then the Lord speaks to him quietly. And this is what the Lord says. The Lord says to him, I want you to go and anoint Jehu as king. Of Israel. Why does that encourage Elijah, do you think? Why do you think he's encouraged by that? Yeah, just. Exactly, because he's going to take away the power from Ahab and Jezebel. He's saying, these people who've been bothering you, these people who want to take your life, I'm going to deal with them. I'm going to take them away. There's going to be a new king. The people that have been worrying you, you're not going to see them much anymore. And then he says something else. I want you also to anoint Elisha, who is going to succeed you after your ministry is finished. You know, that can encourage us as well, can't it? The fact that the Lord gives us friends and helpers and other people to be in the work of God with us. God says you're not alone. You feel alone, but there's actually 7,000 others who believe in me as well. Do we ever get discouraged? Do we ever think to ourselves, I don't know if I can go on? But the Lord says, if you believe in Jesus, you belong to God. And if you belong to God, the Lord expects you to be faithful to him and to tell other people about God. And that can be really tough sometimes. Sometimes we feel as if everybody's having a go at us, everybody's mocking us. We can feel very lonely, as if everybody else doesn't believe in God and we're the only ones who do. But the Lord says, I'm going to encourage you. When you feel down, when you feel lonely, I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to give you rest. I'm going to give you food. I'm going to give you strength. I'm going to speak to you. I'm going to deal with your enemies. I'm going to give you friends so that you are not alone in the world. And I'm going to do all this so that you might be encouraged and that you might carry on in the work of God. 